love God, heal people. Matthew 22, 37 and verse 39, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. This year we are pressing, we are pursuing uh, that we might love God intimately and heal people deeply. So we are learning that loving God intimately empowers us to heal people deeply. And through this verse, when you just read it and you just look at the words, love the Lord your God, this is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. What we see in the reflection of this verse is the fact that God is a passionate God. And that God is seeking passion. He is after passion. And so knowing that, and so as his children, as his prized possession, then we understand this morning that uh, the passion of our hearts is a priority to God. It may not be to us, but it is to him. For he seeks passionate hearts. And the reason this is important, and the reason our Father, our God, is, is a passionate God and he's seeking after passion uh, it is because he is looking for passionate hearts to present to Jesus as the reward of his suffering. Yes? So we know this, that God is not satisfied. God is not content to have an apathetic, cold-hearted, lukewarm church. He wants a church burning with great passion. Yes? A church that burns uh, and, 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 and so that one day he can present this church to his son and said, here, son, this is what you died for. This is what you bought with your precious blood. You bought people with passionate hearts to know how to love and know how to worship their God above all other things. Amen? And so this is what we've been looking at. And so what we've been dealing with over the last few weeks is the fact, is the fact that since God is passionate and he's seeking passionate hearts, uh, the moment we become bored with God and the things of God, uh, revival is needed. I'm going to say it again. Uh, when we become bored, the moment we become bored with God and the things of God, uh, revival is needed. It means it is time for a visitation, yes. And so I have just been trying to exhort you over the, over the last few weeks to this fact, a reality. Jesus is coming to your house. Jesus is coming to this house. And Jesus is coming to this city. You can count on it. He is coming. I feel that so strong in my spirit. So I've been teaching us uh, uh, on how, how important it is that we uh, uh, understand that we are in a time of preparation for visitation. A time of preparation and for visitation. And God, I believe, has spoken very strongly to us. And you, you do understand that when God speaks strongly to a people, it's because he's trying to make them a strong people. Amen. We can't just get in this thing to be blessed. We've got to be in this thing so God can build us to be strong. Amen. Because as we are moving closer to the end of time, uh, you, 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 being blessed ain't going to get you through it. Being built strong in your spirit is going to get you through it. Amen? And so for that to happen, God's got to release a strong word to his people. He's got he's to get us where we can eat steak and where we can receive the word of the Lord. And, and, and so you know what? That cotton candy ain't, ain't going to satisfy me anymore. You see, it'll fill you up but it'll leave you empty. It'll fill you up, and it'll give you a high, but it'll leave you drained later on. But if you can get the meat of what God's Word, it will make you stronger and stronger and stronger. And no matter what goes on in the world, it don't matter. I'm stronger than it is. I'm bigger than it is. I'm faster than it is. Somebody say yes. Yes. And so we're in preparation for visitation. And so I have been diligently studying over the last few weeks about revival because um, when revival comes, Everything is affected. True revival affects everything, and nothing remains the same. When true revival comes, the church will be impacted. And so when, it, when it's here, I won't have to get up and say it's here. We'll know it's here. The church will be impacted, and, and uh, the culture will be influenced when true revival comes. You see, in times of visitation, when, when you study it in Scripture, you will find that God comes to the church first. Then he comes to the culture. If we try to change culture before the church has revival, we will fail. We will fail. This is why we need a visitation 
because our nation needs a visitation. And so biblically and historically, when you study such visitation, some things that you're going to find that, that, that are woven through all of them is, is things like there will be an increase of spirit activity. So the supernatural will be more prevalent. Uh, there will be a, a deep conviction as the spirit of God moves upon his people. There will be a deep conviction of sin in our life. And so there, this, and then followed by this deep conviction... There then will be a pursuit of holiness. Mark it down. So the Spirit of God is poured out. The Spirit of God moves upon the people of God. As He moves upon the people of God, there's a strong conviction of sin in our lives. And then we begin to pursue the holiness of God. This, this is so powerful. Just, just reading your Bible and walk. And then there's this intensity that comes. It's an intensity in the praise, it's an intensity in the level of prayer. And there's also a higher level of intensity in the preaching. Because the preaching uh, begins to penetrate the hearts of the backslider. Yes. So those that could sit in a church service like this week after week after week and not be touched, moved, stirred in any way. All of a sudden, because God is moving by His Spirit, God begins to penetrate the hard hearts. And conviction comes. Repentance comes. Holiness comes. Yes. And the backsliders begin to experience a restoration in, in their lives. And then the last thing that usually follows uh, is this, this amazing restoration to the church of a passion for souls. And this is where, this is where culture is shaped or reshaped. This, this is where a world is changed. This is why revival begins in the church first. Then it moves to the culture. Because the only thing that's going to change culture is culture encounters God. A Christian succeeding is not going to change the culture. No, uh, people succeed every day. Just because I'm a believer and I succeed doesn't mean I want to change culture. Uh, uh, but if I can succeed and move to a higher level, and then I can move in that under the anointing of God in my life, because I now be, I am a revivalist, uh, then I, because I am a lover of souls, uh, then I climb the ladder for one reason. Because every level I go to, there is somebody of influence up there that needs Jesus. That will change culture. Yes? I've been, I've been thinking about this a little bit. See, so I got this deep in my spirit. And so revival, revival is what the church and the culture needs. Good news is what God wants to give us. It's what God wants more than anything else. It's not like God is holding back. God wants to loose a revival in his church. Amen? And so, and so when this happens, revival awakenings, a, a revival awakens uh, our hearts. It awakens our hearts to a new love for God. It awakens our hearts to a new hatred for sin. It awakens us to a new hunger for the Word of God. And it awakens us a new passion for the lost. Man, if we could just get those things going right now, I'm telling you, revival would break out. Amen? Amen. Uh, a great revivalist by the name of uh, Arthur Wallace wrote a book uh, years ago entitled The Day of Thy Power. It's probably one of the greatest revival books I've ever read. He makes this statement. He said, revival is a divine intervention in the normal course of spiritual things. It is God revealing himself to man in awesome holiness and irresistible power. Is the Lord making bare his holy arm and working in ex extraordinary power on saint and sinner? This, this, when I read this, what stuck out at me is that, the, that revival has two distinct expressions of God. One is his awesome holiness. Two is his irresistible power. His awesome holiness and his irresistible power. Uh, you see, when you take the weight of Scripture, you take the Old Testament and the New Testament. Just, just walk with me. I've got to lay this down here. And, and you take the Old Testament and you take the New Testament. Both experienced what we would call revival. But they experienced them in different ways. Because God expressed himself in different ways. You see, there, there, in, in the Old Testament, there were, what, there were 15 revivals. Uh, and and they, they had similar uh, uh, cycles throughout the Old Testament. And, and, and it, it went something like this. It, it, it's that the people of God, everybody say the, the church first. That the people of God would begin to fall and to follow after sin. Uh, and because of this, then there became a spiritual decline in the people of God. And following this spiritual decline, there came a season of suffering. And this season of suffering came because sin is so devastating, you see. 
and their spiritual and the spiritual atmosphere around them begin to decline they begin to backslide into the ways of the world around them and so god could not could not let this continue on so God released levels. Oh, my God. I know that you, this, this is not preached today, but somebody's got to say it. God would release levels of judgment upon his people. Why? So he could get them to a place where they would look around them and see how miserable their life was. And then, they, then in the midst of this time of suffering, they would cry out. And that would be followed by a time, a season of supplication where they would cry out to God. Many times God would raise up a man or God would raise up a woman. God would raise up a revivalist because they were crying out, God, we need you. God, we need to return to you. And God would raise up a man or a woman or a revivalist that could go to them and that could begin to speak the word of God to them. And then when they responded to the word of God, salvation would come and deliverance would come and God would come and he would break through into their lives and they would experience repentance and they would experience restoration and they would, they would experience not only uh, spiritual dynamics, but they would experience over and over again, prosperity would come to their nation. That, that's Old Testament revival. Uh, the four elements you will find in the Old Testament revival. Back, uh, you will find that the people of God are backsliding. Then you will find it's followed by conviction, repentance, and then a returning to God. Over and over and over and over again. It's there for a reason. So we can learn. Watch. And then there's the New Testament revival, which, which takes on a, a different shape. So, so one of the parallel I'm trying to bring, the two, expression, two distinct expressions of God is holiness and power. So in the Old Testament, it was a more of a, of a restoration of holiness because it had to do with the church. And then when you move into the New Testament, then you find things like this. You find words like outpouring of the Spirit. You, you hear things like the gospel was preached. You hear things like there was great conviction and then there was great conversions. You hear things about whole communities turning to Jesus and great cities being populated by Christians and new believers. So, so you see a little bit of a difference between the Old Testament revival and the New Testament revival. In the New Testament, it was about holiness. It was about the people of God uh, getting free from their sin, coming back to God, experiencing God, and God blessing them as they walk in the holiness before their God. And then, and so in His awesome holiness, I'm telling you, when we see His holiness, everything changes in our life. Yes. And so then you have the New Testament church, but it was more about what, what they talked about in the Old Testament is now happening in the New Testament. What they prophesied in the Old Testament, now they're experiencing in the New Testament and the Spirit of God has come. The Spirit of God has come and the Spirit of God is being poured out upon them. And when the Spirit of God comes upon the people of God, then they begin to preach the Word of God with great power. And when they preach the Word of God, there is conviction and there is conversion. But now, it's not inside the church walls, but now cities are being changed and nations are being changed and communities are being changed. Are y'all hearing what, I, what, what I'm saying right now? Yeah, this, this, to me, when I, this really begin to get strong in my spirit because I, I begin to see this. Because both of those expressions uh, we need today. We need them today. You see, if we do not have this experience in the awesome holiness of God and this irresistible power of God, I, when, I, when I saw the irresistible power, the world can't resist the power of God. Amazing. And so we need both expressions of revival. I don't know if this is going to be a revival church or not. We'll find out. You see, if a backslidden church is not confronted and challenged about its apathetic attitudes, then the world will go to hell. You can, you can tweet me on that one. If, 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 if there's not this challenge to move out of our apathy, then we will never be compassionate about the holiness of God. And we will never have the power for effective evangelism. And so, so when I was uh, just looking over this, just, just stay with me. He's going to get better. I begin to reflect on the fact that our, our world 
has a multitude of problems. And I just can't get away from this, but God's ultimate solution has always been to invade humanity with grace and with power through a revived church. It's the way he's always done it. Old Testament, New Testament. And so we can't be too hard on the culture that is around us. We are their only hope. We are the only hope in the earth. And if the church does not have revival, the church at this, at this point does not have the capacity to break through the strongholds of darkness that are, have wrapped our culture up. We can vote, we can gripe, we can complain, but sooner or later, we have to be a revived church. See, revival is the, he- is, is the healing of a deeply wounded and broken world. It is what is going to make the difference. It's what is going to change everything. And so I just come to let you know this morning, good news, good news. Revival is on God's agenda. Revival is on God's agenda. Every time the church has backslidden, God has, has raised up a people and a remnant that are hungry, that refuse to stay in that state and cry out that he might show up and revive his work among them. Good news. Every time the world looks like it's on its last leg and there's no hope and they're turned away from God, God raises up a church to invade them, to influence them, and to demonstrate the goodness and the love and the grace and the power of a God. They may shout, God, leave our country, but there's a people crying out, God, come! Yes. Yeah. And so, and so what, 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 I'm, what I'm learning is this. Most biblical revivals, historic revivals, Last a generation. Now, what I mean by that, not the revival itself as you see it, but the effects of a revival will go a generation. Which means mainly those that encountered it, mainly those that experienced, mainly those that had that, that connection to it. It so changed their life. So it lasts a generation. So what does that mean? Well, consequently, that's telling us every generation needs a visitation. Every generation needs a visitation. I've been in this thing my whole life. I'm 53 years old. I, 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 I've been in church my whole life. But you know what I've never seen? I've never seen a real visitation. You know what I've never been a part of? A real revival. You know what I'm telling you? I'm telling you my generation desperately needs it. My generation, your generation, this time right here, right here, in this sphere of time, needs a visitation of God. If we don't have one, nobody else will. We are responsible for the souls of this generation. And the only way they will be touched is through a revived people. Oh, it burns in me so much. Yes. Oh, I tell God this a lot. You know that? You tell God to God, I think I'm born out of season. I think I should have been born about 20 years ago. Because nobody wants this and nobody preaches this anymore. I'm out of season. God, you, you, you messed up. You put me in the wrong generation. But I'm telling you, every generation needs a visitation. And so... So go, go to Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk was a prophet and a revivalist. Habakkuk, he kind of gets, gets lost in all of this because he, 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 was, he was out there the same time Jeremiah was out there and Daniel was out there and all the, all the big guns were out there prophesying, trying to get Israel back to God. Habakkuk comes along and... Uh, does some amazing things his name his name itself Habakkuk means to wrestle or embrace so his name exemplifies to us the desperate attitude of church needs if we are going to pray corporate revival out of Babylonian captivity then we are going to have to have a passion like Habakkuk Judah has sinned away the grace. God is fed up. God is saying, I've got to lose level of my wrath upon them, or they will just go on. 
And here's Habakkuk. He hears what God is good. God has showed him a vision. Here's what's coming against him. Babylonian captivity is coming against him. They're going to be overtaken. It's going to happen. And here's this prophet, this revivalist. And here in chapter 3 of Habakkuk, it says, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet uh, on the Shigonath. Uh, the interpretation will be correct. Pronunciation? Not so sure. <laughs> O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your works in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timnon and the Holy One from Mount Parim. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was filled with his praise. Oh. And the brightness was like the light and his rays flashing from his hand. And there his power was hidden. Watch Visitation, true visitations produce a demonstration. Between visitation and demonstration is a thing called desperation. Habakkuk is desperate. He's desperate. He knows what's coming. The people of God are just out there doing their own thing, living their own life, going through religious motions. But Habakkuk has heard from God. Something's coming. It's going to devastate this people. It's coming. And he begins to intercede. It says here that he begins to pray. And, 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 and so th th this is amazing to me uh, because he is praying. Because uh, he, he, he's trying to bring them out from having to inc incur uh, Babylonian captivity. Babylonian captivity can, can be many things in Scripture. But one of the things, it is unredeemed culture. An unredeemed culture. And so he begins to pray. And he's trying to pray revival out of this Babylonian captivity. You see, you have to understand something. When, 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 he, when he prays here, the word prayer here is also the word where we, it's interpreted praise. It, it's a word, tihila, uh, or tihala, and, and, and tehilia. And, and it's, a, it's a powerful word, yes. It's a song of praise. Uh, when it says here that he prayed, he prayed, uh, and he prayed on uh, a sig, uh, a sai gonath. The word sai gonath is a Hebrew word, and it literally means this. Watch. Oh, Lord, help me preach this. It literally means a petition set to a wild, enthusiastic, triumphant music. A wild, it's a wild, passionate song. So when Habakkuk is praying, Habakkuk actually is in a mode of praise. And so, really what he is in is what we would call a prophetic prayer or a prophetic praise. And so, you see, Habakkuk is filled. He is filled with the pain of his culture. He sees what's going on around him. And Habakkuk, through the pain of seeing the people of God under a level of judgment, begins to cry out, Oh, oh Lord, revive your works. Revive your works. And in your wrath, remember your mercy. And so what, you, what we see here is there's this cry of desperation. What we see here is he mo he's moving into a mode of intercession. He's moving into a mode of uh, 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 supplication is what he's doing. And, he, and he's crying out to God. And, and it's not just him saying a nice little a quiet prayer, but, but it is him under, uh, with this uh, wild, enthusiastic triumphant music i mean he, I, I see it in my, my mind i don't know if i can explain it to you with my words but i see him somewhere and I, somewhere where the people of god gather somewhere where their minstrels worship somewhere where the levites still worship god and he's gathered with them and but they ain't doing a little soft song i mean they're kicking it they're kicking it and and and, and habakkuk is under the, in the under the presence of god under the uh, the anointing of prophecy and he begins to prophesy and he begins to declare oh lord Revive your works. Revive your works. Revive your works right now, Lord. And in wrath, remember mercy. I, I want you to get this. What is the works of God? What was he crying out for? What he was crying out for, uh, one theologian said, may have been the the, that God would reproduce his redemptive power in the years of crisis which they were in. In other words, uh, he knew he couldn't stop what was getting ready to come upon a nation. But he said, God, in the midst of this, can we not... See your works revived. Can we not 
see your glory revived. Lord, even though it's going to be bad around us, can your people not experience your works? This was so crazy when I began to see this. What is the work of God? Well, our Bible says in Psalm 74, 12, it declares to us, For God is my king from old of old, working salvation in the midst of of the earth. And so the work of God is salvation. So the work of God is deliverance. So the work of God is that when his people get up under a thing, if they will cry out to him, he will come and he will work redemptive power all around them. Yes. Oh, uh, and so, so th- this, is, this is all taking place. And he's crying out to God. He's in a place of desperation. You have to understand the type of prayer that releases a prophetic pl- a flow right here was born out of a desperate heart that understood what it meant to wrestle with the painful issues of a culture while embracing revival and embracing that the work of God might come alive in their midst. You see, it's like you and I understanding we desperately need change in our culture. And we feel for the pain. That, that is gripping those, the, the emptiness and the sadness and the brokenness in our world today. And that kind of a heart, we have to deal with that. We can't walk away from that. We can't shut the doors and let them all go to hell. Somebody's got to deal with it. Somebody's got to stand up and say, you know what, God, revive your works. Because we are believing for a revival. Yes. And so I, 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 let me ask a question so I can figure out if I need to continue on or not. Do, in this house, do we want revival? I would like to see your hands, please. Yes? Yes? Really? Yes? 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 I mean, a real thing. Not some fake, some fuzzy, some... No, I mean, the real deal. I mean, a, a church change and culture change and revival. Yes? Come on, all this craziness that's going on in the church today has got to stop. And we got to get down to business. Souls hanging in the balance. Huh? Somebody say, yes, we want revival. Well, wanting revival and needing revival are two different things. This, 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 you see, we, we have to get to the place for us to our church if we're going to see revival if we're going to experience a revival, then, then we're going to have to move beyond wanting it to needing it. Need means I'm desperate for it. Because God has only promised to meet us at the point of our need, not at the point of our preference. He won't just give us what we want. He'll give us what we need. And I know what I need. I need revival. And our world needs revival, yes? Yes? And so revival is so powerful. See, revival is, is God's radical measure to get the church back to normal. Unless you think we're going off the deep end. We're just trying to get back to normal. We're trying to get back to Book of Acts Church, normal. Before the church falls off into cultural irrelevance. And we're no longer needed here. We have no influence, no impact, nothing. So what does a demonstration look like? Because you see, desperation... I want today to move us, hopefully as the Holy Spirit puts desperation in us, from desperation to demonstration. Desperation to demonstration. What does it look like? Well, Habakkuk gives us, gives us, gives us some ideas here. The first thing that you need to understand, uh, it, it, when there's a visitation in the church, there's going to be a demonstration in the world, and uh, the first thing that happens is God shows up. How about that? That's deep. God shows up. God shows up in the church. God shows up to the world. God shows up. He shows up, and what we see here, it says, who came? The Holy One. The Holy One and His glory covered the heavens. I don't have to take too much time on this because I dealt with this a few weeks ago. The Holy One comes, and He brings glory with Him. When the Holy One comes, He brings glory with Him. Glory is substance. Glory is, is a weighty presence. Glory is the part of God you can feel. Glory. Glory. It's the brilliance and the brightness and the splendor of God. Glory. It's his presence. And please understand, glory is God's restoration strategy. Glory is the fuel 
of the human spirit. We have been created to live in the glory and be energized by the glory. You and I will never become who God has called us to be without his glory. If, I'm never, if I don't get in his presence, I'll never be the man God has called me to be. I have to have his glory. It fuels me. It causes me to arise above my own human nature. It causes me to arise above my own human abilities. It causes me to be what I am not, but be who he has called me to be, his glory. I've got to learn to get in his glory. When his glory comes, get this, think about it. When his glory comes to the church, it is going to raise up a whole new breed of believers. It's going to raise up some people that are powerful, who are confident, who are strong, who know who their God is and know who they are and are ready to make a difference. When God shows up, yes, yes. Our Bible says in Hebrew, uh, Habakkuk, excuse me, 2.14, it says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the promise that Habakkuk is praying for. This is the promise that he's holding on to, you see. Let me just break this down real quickly. Uh, the word filled in this verse. The word filled in this verse means to saturate to overflowing. The word knowledge in this verse means firsthand experience by contact. The word glory here, it, 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 there are many terms for glory, but one, the one here is that God, God who is powerfully demonstrated. God who is powerfully demonstrated. And so the earth will be saturated and overflowing with a firsthand experience by the God who is powerfully demonstrated. Are you getting this picture? Are you seeing this? Can you get a vision of this? Because really, what Habakkuk is seeing right here, after verse 1 and, and after, verse, after verse 2, beginning in verse 3, is he is seeing a vision. He is asking God to revive his work in the midst of the years. He is asking God to do it right now in the midst of a difficult day. He is asking God to do it, and God, fought, God, God shows him a vision. Uh, the Holy One will come, and his glory will come after him. His demonstrated power will come after him. Amen. When God shows up, everything changes. Amen. And he begins to demonstrate. So I just want you to know this, uh, people of God, when God is able to work through us, and God, and then he will be able to work, work in us, he can work through us, and he can begin to demonstrate his glory, he, and when his glory is manifested, nothing is impossible. There will be signs, there will be wonders, there will be miracles, there will be breakthroughs, there will be turnarounds, there will be things that you have carried in your, in your spirit for years, you will see them happen when God shows up. Somebody say yes. Catch the vision. Imagine a world. Uh, imagine a whole city saturated with the glory of God by a firsthand experience with God's holy character and his sovereign power. My God, it will bring transformation. Everybody shout, God shows up. After that, we shout it out. Because he said the earth will be filled with his praise. It's the same word he begins with in the prayer word, the Tehillah. So apparently, there's going to be such a, an amazing demonstration of God. That the whole earth is going to be filled. Saturated and overflowing. With Tehillia. Wild, crazy, passionate, prophetic phrase. You, you, you might as well get your dancing shoes on and get ready to make some noise. The glory of God will pull the praise out of us that we haven't loosed yet. Watch this. When I was looking at this, the, the, the word, the Tehillia praise, in, in, in this verse, literally means to respond in praise as God's splendor, beauty, and power is demonstrated. To respond in praise. It means that we're going through our praise of God. Make his glory famous. I believe it means that God is going to move so powerfully in such a dynamic way through his people. That it's going to bring an authentic testimony of Jesus back to the church. Our Bible says in Revelation 19.10. It says, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The point I'm getting to is that when God shows up, 
he is going to deal so powerfully with his people that they are going to have to shout it out. The goodness of God. You are going to have a testimony that's going to cause the world not to be able to resist coming to Jesus. See, you're going to be able to walk into their world and let them tell you their story. And then you're going to be able to tell them your story. And then you're going to be able to tell them his story. And then history is going to be changed. Because there's a people that ain't going to be mealy mouthing around. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to tell them what God has powerfully demonstrated in your life. Get ready for a demonstration of God over your when the glory comes. When God shows up, you can't help but be a testimony in the earth. That, that's so powerful. You know what that's so powerful to me? Because I, I was, I was uh, studying this week and I found this out. I found out a new poll. They just did a new poll that asked the question, how did you come into the church? 8,000 people, they asked, how did you come into the church? Through advertisement, 0.1%. Through the pastor, 6.8%. Through walk-ins, 4.6%. Through door-to-door uh, witnessing, 1.2%. Through the wonderful programs of the church, 2.4%. Through friends and family, 70 to 90%. You get it? It's the family friend plan. When you and I can declare the goodness of God, it is the goodness of God that shall bring them to repentance. When you and I portray before them a God that is worthy of our life, they will come running, they will come running, they will come running. Somebody shout it out! And the last one is this. After God shows up and we shout out, God's going to show off. Yes, he does. Look what it says. And his brightness was like the light. And he had rays flashing from his hand. And there his power was hidden. Where? In his hand. You see, he's, he's, he's given. See, God hasn't released all his power yet. It's hidden in his hand. You know, several years ago through the God chaser and Tommy Tenney, God was trying to get the church back. He said, quit going after his hand and go after his face. And he said, if you go off his face, you'll get his hand. But he was using the hand in a negative way because it can be used in a negative way. In other words, he was saying we only go after God for what we can get for him. But when you go after his face, you're going after relationship. You're going after intimacy. And I understand. I believe that. And I believe, watch this. But when you look at this verse, when he talks about the brightness of God, some, some theologians believe it's talking about the face of God. The face of God and then the hand of God. And so what well, Habakkuk's seen in this verse, he said, listen, he said, there's coming a time when the church and the world will experience both the face of God and the hand of God. The face of God being the grace of God. The face of God being the favor of God. The hand of God being his power. The hand of God being his authority. He said there's coming a day in the church, in, in, in the world where God's not going to hold it all back anymore but he's going to reveal it. He's going to reveal it. I'm telling you what, God is on the, on the verge of revealing his power once again. God is on the verge. He wants a people that will seek his face and seek his hand. I want your grace. I need your grace, but I need your power. Somebody shout, yes. And so when I was was looking at this and I was understanding this, so it's telling us here that God's face and hand are going to be revealed. But when they are revealed, it's going to be revealed in great power and in great favor. This took place in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 4, verse 33. Listen to this. It's so powerful. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them. And great grace was upon them. I want you to get this. Great power and great grace. Great power to witness. Great power to shout out. Great power to articulate the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that cannot be, that cannot be resisted. That we will have such a power about us that the world will not be able to walk away but they will be it will be like a magnetism that will draw them to the goodness and the grace of God is anybody hearing this God is ready to show off God is ready to step down on this people planet again God is ready to rip the roof off this place and come down in here and reveal his power somebody say yes 
shall power now. It's time for us to, to rise up and receive our power. When Jesus uh, was sending his disciples out, uh, he sent them out. He said, before you go, be clothed with power from on high. See, this is why before he comes to the culture, he comes to the church, because the church needs this amazing experience of grace and power. So that when we go to the world, we are empowered to release grace. This is important. So how do we get this kind of power, Pastor? Well, if you look at the book of Acts, they got it when God showed up. That's when they, they got it. When the Holy Spirit came. When God showed up. They received power. They asked him to come. If we ask him to come, he will come. But not just, oh, come, God. I mean a true desperate thing in our heart that cries out, come, God. Come, God. Come to my house. Come to this house. Come to our city. And then when he comes, he will give us a mantle that will pierce the darkness. Light, brilliance was coming out of God. The world is waiting for us to rise up and to demonstrate that the reality of God is true. He said they gave great witness, or they had great power to the witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, you have to understand something. The resurrection shows us that uh, Jesus is a dominant force and he has dominant power and he is a conquering king because he has conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave and he is alive and he is active and he's on the move. He's just looking for people that are ready to exceed their level of comfort and are ready to experience a demonstration of God. I've come to tell you today, prepare for a demonstration. Are you ready for that? Won't you get up on your feet and give God praise in this house right now? Are you ready? Are you ready for God to tear the roof off this place? Are you ready for God to step down in this house? Are you ready for God to come to your house and tear the roof? Are you ready for God's presence to saturate your life? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? I got to ask this question as I give the call to the altar today. Yes, we're coming back to the altar. Yes, we're coming back to the altar because this is where it all begins. Let me go back to that question I asked in the middle of the message. Do we want revival or do we need revival? Because the need is going to bring him. The desperation. Leonard Ravenhill, another great revivalist, said, we will not have revival as long as we are content to live without it. I can't live without it. I can't get, d keep doing this church thing without it. Because it's got to be more and about just this. Is, this is, I love this. This is powerful. This is where we're going to have some amazing experiences with God. So we're just going to demonstrate himself to you so you can go out to the world and demonstrate him to them. But we must say, God, we as a church corporate body need revival. I need a visitation today. I'm believing for huge things to happen next week. But before we get to that, we've got to take care of some stuff here. I got to know in this house. You got to know. Are you ready to push? Are you ready to pray? Are you ready to believe? Are you ready to experience God at a whole nother level? Are you ready for a visitation? Are you ready for a demonstration? You say, Pastor, that's my heart. That's what I bleed for. That's what I hope for. I know, I know it's what I need, and I know it's what my neighborhood needs. It's what the nations need. It's what we need. We need it. We need it. Then we got to come take it. We got to come take it. 
I'm going to ask you to join me around in front of this building, and we're going to take it today. We're going to take it today. We're going to make ourselves available. We're going to tell God, no, there's a church right down there in, in the middle of Peoria. A church, right? 2014, God. And we're not ashamed to say we need and want revival. Hallelujah. Come on, guys. This is awesome. This is powerful. God cannot resist. Come on, make this song your prayer. You to I just want you to receive a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit this morning. I want you to receive a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit this morning. 
If you have your hand, heavenly language, I want you to release it right now. Come on. We're a spirit-filled church. Come on. You can pray in the Holy Spirit in this church. If you've never received, just receive now by faith and release, release your heavenly language. Come on, stir up, stir up, stir up, stir up, stir up the reverse. Hallelujah, Lord, we cry out. We cry out. Come, Lord, come. Lord, come at a whole new level. Come in a whole new way. Come in a way that fresh start church we've never experienced you before, God. Come and reveal yourself to us, O Lord. But we are so ready for you to revolutionize us and change us and revive us. That your works might be revived in the midst of the years. That we might see you revived in our city. See you revived in our schools. See you revived in the marketplace. See you revived, O God. See you, O God. See your glory. See your power. See your goodness. See your grace. Demonstrated upon, O God, a hurting, broken culture, Father. Lord, we invite you to come. We invite you to come, Lord. We invite you to come, Lord. Change us that we might change the world. And we thank you for it, Father. We praise you for it, Father. Father, thank you that as we go through the days that are ahead that we're going to just begin to experience you in ways that are maybe way, way more than we're comfortable with or used to. But that's okay, God. Just do what you got to do to get us where you need to get us so that we can make a difference and influence a culture, God. God, I ask you that the river that you prophesied to us would flow through this house. Amen. Let it flow. Let, let it flow through this house, God. And then out of this house to a city and to cities and to nations. But we, we make ourselves available and useful to you, O oh God. We surrender all. And we thank you for it. We thank you for it. Hallelujah. I want you to make something like that a prayer that you pray every day for your house and this house. Until he comes. You see, Pastor, God's here. Yes, he's here, but we need him to come to a whole other level and experience. Yes. Until we know it's, this is it. It's happening. And you know how we're going to know that more than anything else? Because we're going to see the lost flood into the kingdom of God. And then the atmosphere of a city will shift. As it did in the book of Acts. Because there was more saved people than lost people. Amen. See, I believe my God is a big God. And he's, he's salvation strong. Yes, he is. Amen. Amen. So bow your heads, please. I just do this real quick. Uh, not that it's not important, because it is. I just need to make sure that everybody here has a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you say, I, I, don't, I don't really have an up-to-date current relationship with God. Maybe, you've, maybe you have, but maybe to, what, we were, what the Bible calls backslidden. That means you're, you're, not, you're not living at the current level at, that you once were, the highest level you once had with God. In your relationship, you don't have that today. You're backslidden. You need to repent, come back to God, and let him restore that first love. So maybe you need to do that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, say this prayer in just a moment. And say, say, Pastor, I need Jesus. I need to be saved. I need salvation. I need a relationship with God. Or I need to renew my relationship with God. If, if, if either one of those, or am I speaking to you? I want you to throw your hand up right now high. Throw it up straight up. Anyone in the building today? I see two hands right there. Anyone else? You say, that's me. I need that. Okay, right there. Anybody else? I said, I think, I think at least three, three have raised their hands. Hold them up high. I would like for somebody that knows Jesus very well to go, go stand with those that got their hands up and just, just, just be with them and pray over them. Father, I pray, I pray for these that raised their hands. I pray that they would have an encounter with you, a genuine life-changing experience. I want all of us to pray this prayer, especially those that, that are raising your hands right now. Say this prayer with me. Jesus, today I surrender all. Jesus, I believe. You're the Savior of the world, and I'm a sinner. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Take my life. Come into my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me and giving me a fresh start. Thank you, Jesus, for
for restoring me to my relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, for accepting me just as I am. Thank you, Jesus, for a fresh start. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise in the house. Amen. Hallelujah.